there are always the video game consoles that are just too good for this world. And by good, I mean terrible, just god-awful. An idea may be sound, but if people aren't ready for it, a video game system is bound for failure. However, the system bombing may not be because an idea was bad. It may just be that players weren't ready for it yet, or that the technology didn't exist to truly support the system itself. Let's take a look at some of the most terrible video game systems ever made and review why the ideas failed, even though many years later, they'd be successful. Any list of ahead of their time systems would be incomplete without a comprehensive review of the Virtual Boy. The marketing for this system, which was released in 1995, promised immersive 3D graphics, and it kinda delivered on that. Development on the system actually started in 1985 when the eyepiece display technology was first developed by a company called Reflection Technology. Nintendo licensed the tech, even though Sega, Mattel, and Hasbro had all passed. That probably should have been an indicator that this was a bad idea. Nintendo used a bright red light that was cheaper, used less battery, and gave a broader sense of depth than a backlight colored LCD. The device wasn't ready for Premiere until 1994, and at the time, Nintendo said they expected to sell 3 million hardware units and 14 million games. The system premiered on December 22, 1995 in Japan and August 1996 in the United States. All systems came pre-packaged with Mario Tennis. And man did this device bomb! By the time it was discontinued, it sold a mere 770,000 units, well short of its projections, ultimately becoming the worst selling console that Nintendo ever made. So what happened? Why did the system go wrong? How much time do you have? Most important was this. The red lines? Not great. Players immediately complained of headaches, eye pain, and nausea. Video games need to be a lot. Not causing physical pain should probably be at the top of any list. Speaking of pain, check out the ergonomics of this device. As you can see, the sucker is awkward. You can't really wear it on its own while you're sitting, and you can't even really use it while you're standing. You sort of have to lean into it. And that, of course, can be really uncomfortable, and players complained of a variety of head and neck pains. Furthermore, the device was so big and bulky that you couldn't move it anywhere. The system, the games, the controller, the tripod, none of it made for easy movement. In other words, this weird system tried to be a standalone system that was also portable. In reality, it was neither. Also worth noting, the library was super slim. When it premiered in North America, only four games, Mario Tennis, Galactic Pinball, Red Alarm, and Tillero Boxer, hope I got that right, were available. Within the next three months, only five more games premiered. Another five games premiered in the following three months, and that was it for the system in North America. The problem is that was still expensive for a system that caused you pain, barely had any games, and threatened to damage your vision. But I mean, other than that, the system worked great. In all fairness, what's kind of funny here is that virtual reality still has not been completely cracked almost 30 years after the release of the Virtual Boy. Numerous virtual systems are now on the market, including the PlayStation VR 2, the MetaQuest 3, the Oculus, and more. But problems remain. For example, the PlayStation VR 2 has been such a disappointment in sales that a recent reports indicate that PlayStation is going to stop making the devices in order to let some of their inventory be sold first. The Virtual Boy was 30 years ahead of its time. Even now, it might still be too early. Next, let's talk about another system that was another great idea, but again, too early. The Satellaview. The Satellaview, also from 1995, was an add-on to the Super Famicom, which is the Japanese version of the Super Nintendo. The Satellaview never made it out of Japan, but it had a major impact on gaming because it helped show us the future. The Satellaview was created by St. Giga, which itself is a subsidiary of WowWow, wow, a Japanese satellite television company. St. Giga was a digital radio satellite station and one of the first in the world. However, in 1994, a recession was hitting the company hard. Nintendo purchased a minority stake in the company and restructured it. In exchange, St. Giga began to concentrate on Nintendo development, including the Satellaview. So, the Satellaview was attached to the bottom of the Super Famicom, and it came with rewritable memory. The modem component of the device would connect with a central device, which could then allow users to download content at prearranged times. Users could do so by tuning the BS tuner. So, what was available? Honestly, a lot. A total of 116 games were released, including episodic content for mainstay series like Zelda, Super Mario Brothers, and more. Much of the content has been lost to the ages, but some has been successfully found and uploaded by internet archivists. 
There are also a series of other unique games that were only available on Satellaview, including sports games, fishing games, and add-on to games like Chrono Trigger. Magazines could even be downloaded and read on the television. Keep in mind that games were downloaded in the same way that radio was listened to. In other words, data could only flow one way. As such, multiplayer games like those you'd play today were not possible. However, there were quizzes that would allow for some level of competition between players. The system was for the rich. It was about 14,000 yen, equal to $150 at the time, or again, about $370 in today's money. That pushed the limits of what was an acceptable add-on to the consumer. As part of a way to maintain profits, Nintendo only released the system through a mail order. Stores were completely cut out of the ordering chain here. The system was innovative, but it was too innovative. Despite projections of nearly 2 million in sales, by 1997, the system only had a little more than 116,000 active users. Nintendo, angered by St. Giga's lack of effort to manage their debt, ceased new content production in March of 1999. By June 30th, 2000, with a mere 46,000 active users, Satellaview closed up shop. And with it, it took down subscription-based gaming and marked the end of using digital games to make money. Right? Right. Good talk. Speaking of modem-based play, the Satellaview was one of many devices, and it wasn't the only one that had the capabilities to allow for some sort of internet gaming. In 1998, the Sega Dreamcast was released. The system was a commercial failure, and actually the last console produced by Sega. However, as the first sixth-generation video game system, the Dreamcast had a lot of innovations, including being the most advanced system on the market at the time. It also had the first ever built-in modem. And, unlike the Satellaview, the Dreamcast allowed players to play against each other and find matches. In fact, the Dreamcast went even deeper. They created online services, similar to Xbox Live, that allowed for players to play each other. Different networks were set up in different regions. In Japan, there was Drikus. In the United States, SegaNet. For Europe, there was Dream Arena, and for Australia, there was Kama. Different games were supported in different regions. There was also some downloadable content that you could access directly from the service. Dozens of games, including Capcom vs. SNK, Bomberman Online, Quake 3, and NBA 2K1, were playable online, and you could use the service to play against other people. Other games had downloadable content, online leaderboards, or added content like music. All of these networks had a monthly subscription fee. In some cases, they were actually pretty expensive. For example, SegaNet's monthly fee was $21.95, more than most of us pay for Netflix now. The problem with this idea? I mean, honestly, there were a lot. Despite the extreme forward-thinking nature of Sega, they were obviously right about leaning into internet-based gameplay and downloadable content, the system didn't have the memory to support the concept. With limited storage capacity on the visual memory unit seen here, players couldn't play many games without deleting and then reinstalling games. Even worse was the modem itself. The modem was 56K, which was relatively fast at the time, but that wasn't fast enough. As any modern player knows, even with the best connection about 25 years later, modern technology still doesn't completely support internet-based gameplay. Online gameplay could get laggy and broken with the modem. Truly live instantaneous play was extremely difficult. Broadband adapters hit the market, but that was in June 2000 in Japan and January 2001 in the United States. This was more than two years after the system came out, and it was too late. Finally, there were development issues that were amplified by marketing miscues. Sega said that at launch, games would support online play, but that didn't actually happen. In fact, this led to a filing of legal complaints in Europe, which, considering Sega's serious reputational issues caused by the Saturn, only amplified their problems. In the end, despite how great the idea was, the newness of online play and the lack of technology to fully support it clipped the Dreamcast, and its online capabilities were never truly reached. We're gonna go back in time now and talk about another system that had the right idea at the wrong time. A relatively unknown entry into the gaming world is the TurboGrafx-16, also known as the PC Engine outside of North America. This was the first 16-bit system. It was produced by NEC Home Electronics and did relatively well, selling more than 5.6 million units. It was never enough to beat Sega or Nintendo, but that's still not bad. So why are we talking about this relatively obscure system? Well, like all systems at the time, its games were cartridge-based. Until they weren't. In 1988, TurboGrafx unveiled the TurboGrafx CD, making it the first system to ever use CD-ROMs instead of cartridges. Now, as you can see, this system was a big thing. It included the CD-ROM itself, as well as a large interface unit that connected the CD-ROM and operated as a power supply. At launch, two games, Fighting Street and Monster Lair, were available. 
Unfortunately, those were the only two games that came out in the first six months of the system's existence. Ouch. Four games would follow. Over 100, in fact. Other slimmer versions of the TurboGrafx CD, including the Super CD-ROM and Core graphics, would follow. So, was this really a failure? In all honesty, that's a little tough to say. Remember, 5.6 million consoles were actually sold, but that includes all versions of the system, not just the CD-ROM versions. No numbers are available for how many units the CD-ROM sold, at least none that I could find. One can assume that if the system had truly been a financial success, a sequel would have been released that would have also been successful. The PCFX was released in 1994, but only 400,000 units were sold, and that was the end of this line of consoles. Even worse for the TurboGrafx CD was the price. The system premiered at $399 for an upgrade. And that's $399 in 1988 money, which is equal to $1,046 today. No. No thank you. Finally, the multiple versions and variations, including the Turbo Graphics, the Super CD-ROM, the Arcade Card, the Core Graphics, and the Super Graphics, all of which came with the original system and the CD-ROM, just confused the market further. In other words, this was a great idea. But again, too ahead of its time, too poorly executed, and too expensive. So, what's the lesson here? You tried your best, and you failed miserably. The lesson is, never try. No, no, that's, that's not it. All four of these systems went for something big, new, and exciting. Be it new graphics, whole new ways of playing, or connecting the world in an amazing new way, all four systems tried to do something new. The problem was the lack of support and understanding by the marketplace. So look, hindsight's 2020, right? We know why these systems failed. But all these systems were new. Now, new systems, as we know, often work. The Wii was successful because of its unique use of motion controls. The Xbox brought the power and computing and knowledge of Microsoft. Hell, the Atari practically invented the market. I'd argue that what distinguishes failures from successes isn't luck. It's knowing your product and knowing your audience. Did it really take a genius to tell Nintendo not to design a product that didn't make people sick? Or that a CD-ROM add-on shouldn't cost someone as much as a mortgage payment? In all four of these cases, companies misunderstood either their product, the audience, or both. And that combination usually led to failure. And that is it for this video. As always, I hope you enjoyed it because I got to tell you, I love making these things. That's why they're coming out so fast right now. Please hit the subscribe button. Please hit the like button. That'll help boost us in the algorithm and make sure that you get more content. Thank you, friends. Have a wonderful day out there. Be well, everybody.